listen intently, uh, speak uh, questions that you have. This isn't gonna be about their life, but what we benefit from their work and their lives. So we're gonna start with Mary, I believe. Uh, and, and before I go, um, Mary Harris is with me and Lynn Streep, and you guys can also talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, if you wanna do a little intro, and then we're just gonna speak briefly and then I'll come back to Helen. Mary, you wanna go first? Yes, thanks Greta. I am going to share information about the legacy of Brenda Engel. Brenda was born in 1924. She was a watercolor artist and a documenter of children's work and teachers' practices of evaluation. For me, Brenda's legacy is largely this book because this is how I know Brenda primarily. Her book is Holding Values, What We Mean by Progressive Education, Essays by Members of the North Dakota Study, book, study Group, and it was published in 2005. So through this book, I came to know those NDSG members of the first 30 years, and I learned the details about the first meeting, which Brenda did not attend, but she interviewed the people who were there, and she reported on that first meeting, which focused on better ways to evaluate children in the federal Head Start and Follow Through programs. So the focus was on young children. Brenda recognized equity and respect for children were central purposes of the founders who met. And then she, Brenda, attended the second meeting, which was held in Chicago in 1973. Brenda taught art at Hascom Primary School in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and at Cambridge Friends School, obviously in Cambridge. She later joined the teacher education faculty at Leslie College, where she taught uh, and wrote about documentation of learning processes and alternative forms of assessment as an art educator, she was especially interested in portfolios. She published monographs about portfolio assessment and teacher record keeping, retiring in 2009. Brenda continued to paint until her death last October. After 97 years, of close observation, documenting educational practices, and organizing for peace and justice. Thank you. Go ahead, Lynn. OK. Are you next, Lynn? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about Patricia Carini. Um, Pat Carini uh, was one of the founding members of North Dakota Study Group. Uh, she came to the first meeting. Vito invited her, I believe, because she was already uh, making some waves about uh, uh, description and evaluation. And um, in the early years, the focus of the North Dakota study group was on developing alternatives to standardized testing, um, especially of young children. Um, Pat had been a founder of, with her husband, Lou, and another person of um, a small school in North Bennington, Vermont. The school was about to be uh, integrated into the public school system when, because of the death of uh, one of the administrators in the state, 
uh, that never happened. But the school and Pat in particular had a, a powerful effect worldwide actually. She was a profound observer and listener. And she showed us that observing and describing gave much more information than the tests. Though of course, People who liked the tests were looking for different information. She did her work at the Prospect School. Pat's influence has been international. Prospect's descriptive processes or adaptations are practiced around the world. The primary purpose of a descriptive process is to bring together varied perspectives in a collaborative manner so that you can describe a child's experience in the classroom, a piece of student work, a whole school, an educational issue, a teacher's practice, and more. If you describe a child, the process is called the descriptive review of the child. The child is described fully in these terms, physical presence and gesture, relationships with other students and adults, emotional tenor, the child's interests and academics. The group sessions um, in which these descriptions are held often end with recommendations for the student or the teacher based on the description. And the recommendations always support the students and the teacher's strengths. Educators, whether within teacher groups, universities, schools, have learned, and parents as well, they've learned that, as Mara has said several times this weekend, the knowledge a group creates is greater than what can be created by an individual. Within the descriptive processes circle, everyone, teacher, parent, administrator, psychology, it doesn't matter your educational level. Everyone is equal. And I'm just going to end with some of Pat's It matters greatly, therefore, to whom we accord the status of person. I mean by that, whom do we see and act toward as capable? Whom do we see and act toward as contributing? Whom do we know to have, as we know ourselves to have, hopes and fears and joys and struggles? Whom do we know to have, as we know ourselves to have, the strong desire to have their lives mean something, the deep desire to add some measure of worth to the world? It matters greatly whom we recognize to have, as we know ourselves to have. Moments of pain and falling back and doubts and moments of experience the fulfilling satisfaction from word, work well done, work of benefit to ourselves and to others. It matters greatly whom we know to be, as we know ourselves to be, vulnerable to loss and grief, grief, vulnerable to shame and humiliation and pride, vulnerable to the extremes of our own passions, vulnerable to self-satisfaction and greed. This is, as I understand it, what it is to be human, a person. Thank you, Lynn. So I get the esteemed pleasure to just speak to the legacy that Helen Featherstone not only brought to North Dakota Study Group, but to the world and to the world as mother, as she championed a book that dealt with the disadvantage, I mean, with the challenges of a child who was severely, severely disabled from birth and the nurturing. And so as you think about this, and if you know anybody that faced this or have faced it yourself, it can be very personal, obviously, 
But what Helen did was take that out of herself to inform and become an activist. And so we've been talking about the themes as we look to this 50 years of reunion in this family, we like to call it. And there were certain things that this group, as you've been here since Thursday or Friday or, and, and today, there are just certain themes that just recur every time we gather. And I want you to be thinking about those things as we speak to these women and as we talk about it further and look back as what you've heard today. So there's a theme of evaluation and activism. So as I was speaking about Helen and how she not only took that struggle and turned it in a way to not just, I think one of the you said today, activism isn't just protest, it isn't just doing something. I, I, I wish I remember who said it, but it is being. And Helen was being an activist as she cared for this child and then reached out to other people to share the community, to build spaces of community, to focus on the needs, the wants, and the strength to work together for those kinds of things. That thing was what Helen leaves leads to us, left with us that we still do. She also was extremely, extremely interested and curious. She asked questions and engaged around schools. She often held study groups for new teachers and the teacher of education at Michigan State University, where it was more than just academic, just going through the rituals. It was learning like Dewey, taught us to learn, doing with, doing uh, place-based, asking questions, inquiry, and study. That's what we're doing here. When we go on our little breakup groups and we look at um, certain issues, that's a legacy that she embraced as well. She was extremely, extremely wise. You would never notice Helen in the room but she was always in the space. And she was wise to, she often would just speak in a quiet voice when it was appropriate. She soaked in so much of what people said and observed so much. And that's what we've been asking people to do today. That is straight from the book of Helen 101. Observe and then be very thoughtful and deliberate about what you have to say. Equity. One thing that you would always know about Helen that you would describe her as a woman of common sense, common sense because she saw equity as one in common, equity in what every human deserves. Whether you're talking about schools, schooling, education, uh, uh, living uh, the basic rights of life, every, what does every human deserve? Common sense. She didn't need to be very, very theoretical, just common sense. If my children can have good teachers, if my children can have good schools, good books, good access, every human being deserves that. And that's her voice of equity. Evaluation was not about testing for some silly little bubble. It was about evaluating the substance of what people bring to the subject. She worked very hard with um, collective instruction and I'm, I'm not calling it what it is right now, but uh, how to teach mathematics. She was a mathematics professor uh, of teacher of education and making math fun. She was a prolific writer as Helen was uh, getting ready to make her transition to this. She was writing a book, uh, a, a realistic historical fiction on civil war. So she was forever, ever, ever learning. And what she did was connect people. So her legacy is here. And she was humorous. So if you see me laughing, and if you see Helen found the humor and things that weren't funny, and I don't mean in a way that broke the pain, in a way that broke the tension. She wasn't disrespectful at all, but she was humorous and funny. 
so 